Welcome to Ear Crush, the Friday podcast for people who love listening to great stories. I'm your host, Stephen Campbell, and my co-host this week is Mark Stiegler, the author of the Brain Trust series, which currently includes three books, The Brain Trust, Harmony of Enemies, Crescendo of Fire, and Rhapsody for the Tempest. And for our purpose, he's also the author of today's story, which will run for the next three weeks, Bits Run Free. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's a delight to be here. It's a delight to have you here. I am such a fan of the Brain Trust series. I, I've read the first book, and then I listened to the narration of the first book, and I'm waiting for the, the final version to be released on Audible for books two and three, which are coming down the pike very quickly. Um, I'm actually expecting book two to come out sometime this week and then maybe another month or so for book three. So I'm, I'm super excited to listen to, to book two. But before we, before we get to today's story, can you just give us a little bit of background uh, for the idea behind or the world of the Brain Trust? Sure enough. Uh, the Brain Trust uh, was born after uh, the presidential election in 2016, and it's a story of one of the possible futures. Uh, in the Brain Trust future, one of the things that happens is the federal government expels all the foreign engineers from Silicon Valley. The Valley companies respond to this by anchoring a fleet of cruise liners off the coast of San Francisco and moving all their engineering teams out there. As a consequence, you have this uh, immensely uh, intelligent, very densely populated collection of some of the smartest people in the world. The Brain Trust is born. And it's, I don't know, the, the book, I love the concept of all these smart people being collected and the idea of them just being on ships offshore a little bit. There's just so much richness in, the, in just the, the world of the brain trust. So I'm really excited to get to books two and three. And our story today is Bits Run Free, and it actually runs parallel, I think you told me, to book two. That is correct. There's an event in book two called First Launch. It's early in the book. And this story takes place in the same time frame uh, as the first launch. Okay. And for people who have not yet read or listened to The Brain Trust, um, could you give us a sense of the primary characters in the books, in the series? Sure. The, uh, the primary trio, the three musketeers, as <laughs> you might think of them, are Dash who is a brilliant medical researcher who is a jack of all trades in addition to doing medical research. She's from Bali. Uh, she's based on an actual person that I met while I was in Bali at one point. Uh, and she is sort of the lead character. Then she has her two best friends forever, Ping and Jam, who are both uh, peacekeepers on board the Brain Trust. And they, they face a wide variety of bizarre problems. There's a lot of humor in these books, isn't there? Uh, I like to think so, and many of the people who read the books and do reviews on uh, Amazon agree. Uh, they're certainly intended to be lighthearted, uh, and uh, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot of fun to be had with them. In particular, uh, lots of people especially love the scenes with mediator Joshua, who winds up <laughs> mediating some of the strangest uh, encounters you will ever see on the Brain Trust. One such encounter occurs in Bits Run Free. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you mentioned Silicon Valley. You spent a good bit of your life in the Valley, didn't you? That is correct. I spent over 10 years in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was an executive for a Fortune 500 company, the VP of Engineering, uh, and I eventually wound up also being a visiting scholar and a research scientist for Hewlett Packard Laboratories. And wrapped around that, you have been nominated multiple times for awards for your science fiction writing, both before and after your career uh, in Silicon Valley. That's correct. In the 80s and the 90s, I was uh, a finalist for both the Prometheus 
and the Hugo Awards. And just recently, the first book of the Brain Trust series was nominated for the Prometheus Award as well. And for people who may not know, um, the Brain Trust series is published by LMBPN Publishing, the people who are behind this podcast. So we're, we're thrilled to have your books as part of the LMBPN family, and we're, ha- we're thrilled to have you on this podcast. So Mark, do you want to introduce the story of uh, Bits Run Free? Sure. Very briefly, uh, this is the story of a 12-year-old boy who's doing his homework. However, doing your homework on the brain trust can get you into a <laughs> lot of hot water. And that is what happens to our main character, Charlie Winston, today. Okay, so let's get to the story. It is narrated by Catherine McEwen, and she will be our guest host next week. And then we will wrap up with part three of this story with Mark joining us, uh, joining us again in two weeks. So, Mark, thanks for being here, and we look forward to chatting with you again. Let the bits run free. The net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. John Gilmore, Electronic Frontier Foundation, 1993. Harry Ledbetter collapsed into the chair in front of his computer. Jesus, what a bitch of a day. It had started with a loud chewing out by his boss. The California Attorney General had deleted the folder with all his most vital information, again, and Harry's boss had conveyed the AG's demand, again, that the files be restored from backup within the hour, including all the changes the AG had made in the previous 15 minutes. Harry's boss knew perfectly well that recovering from the California government's backup DB was a cumbersome undertaking at the best of times. He also knew that this, with the audit almost upon them, was the worst of times. But his boss had not gotten his promotion by telling the AG that his demands were unreasonable. He'd gotten the promotion by blaming his underlings with unequaled skill and determination. Harry's day had only gone downhill from there. So here he was, past midnight, finally getting the time to do his normal tasks. Except now... Goddamn Priscilla in the chief security officer's elite clique decided to add to his woes. Her email said, Harry, you need to fix your security settings, immediately, or I'll be locking you out at noon Tuesday. Follow this link. Christ, less than 12 hours before lockout. He slugged down three gulps of his Mark V blue agave energy drink and clicked the link. Damn. He was tired. As usual, the security monologue screen came up to warn him that the security cert was invalid. Damned Priscilla needed to clean up her own house, along with all her damned certs, before she complained about his. He clicked OK through all the dialogues to get to the meet, namely the page demanding his username, his password, and a brand new code off of his two-factor authentication dongle. He typed them all in. That should have been it. But no, the purpose of a security system was to force the user to see how hard the security experts were working to make everyone's life miserable. Bruce Schneider, the ultra-famous security uber geek, had named it Security Theatre decades earlier. The principles still applied. So instead of letting him in, the goddamn security system complained he was at a new location. What the fuck? The wheels on his chair were still stuck in the little ruts they'd imprinted in the carpet under his desk. A new location? Are you kidding me? Oh, wait. They'd rewired the Ethernet routers, and he probably had a new IP address. That was probably it. Yeah, you damn machine. Send me a text message on my phone. Beep, beep. Here it is. Okay, here's the confirmation code. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank God he was finally in. He could get some real work done at last. Damn. He was tired. Charlie Winston hunched over his laptop, his eyes slowly widening 
as he watched the target of his fishing attack go through all the steps needed to put Charlie into the system. It was all going just like Professor Thornhill had explained. Find a target whose security machinery gets in his way all the time, so he bypasses warnings without a thought, and hit him when he's at the end of a long, exhausting day, when he's not thinking straight anyway. Even a twelve-year-old, his teacher had promised, could outwit the typical half-wit when the half-wit was at his wit's end. Visiting Scholar Carp, an expert on both computer security and user interface interaction, had disagreed with that characterization of the fishing victim as a half-wit, though. He'd explained that everyone was a half-wit, even genius experts in the field of security, if the user interface forced the user into half-wit behavior. Letting security experts touch the user interface made no more sense than having your plumber reprogram the autopilot on your copter. Don't get cocky, Hid said. With the kind of ghastly security patchworks people built dirt side, this could happen to you too. And Charlie had just done it to the great blue state of California. Very cool. Charlie now had access to all the backup files for the entire California government. He was sure to earn some extra merit reward tokens for this. What should he get to show he'd succeeded? Just one file, or maybe a folder, something that would certainly prove he'd been here. He started looking around, previewing stuff, and finally turned to the Attorney General's private files. He'd overheard a lot from the Space R people in the past few days about that jerk, the AG, while they ran around all the ships of the Brain Trust hunting down equipment. They had to try to complete a sea-based rocket launch system in ten days to beat a deadline they had because the AG had passed a law to hurt Space R really badly. Charlie found the AG's writing very entertaining The guy was so over the top in his anger at anybody who disagreed with him that Charlie couldn't help laughing. But then, Charlie found something labelled the Golden Folder. That sounded very promising. Inside the folder, he found a fascinating list of people, some of whose names he recognised. Charlie didn't understand the legalese explaining the government's plan, but it looked like Space R wasn't the only bunch of people the AG planned to hurt. Charlie shivered, copied the golden folder to his thumb drive, and shut down his computer. His six-year-old brother watched him intently from the bottom bunk of the tiny cabin they shared on board the Gplex 2. Charlie frowned at his annoying brother. What's wrong with you? He snarled. Bobby whined. You're keeping me up. I can't sleep with you typing all night long. Just doing my homework. You should do your homework during the day like a normal person. Charlie snapped back. It's a special assignment. It has to be done at night. Bobby rolled his eyes. You always have an excuse. And you always have a complaint, whiner. Charlie held up his thumb drive triumphantly. But I'm done now anyway. I've got something really special here. Professor Thornhill is just gonna love my latest homework. He yawned. Go back to sleep, twerp. That's what I'm gonna do. He'd done enough for tonight. He'd show the golden folder to his teacher in the morning. Earl Anderson had traveled an unusual career path to become a computer breach investigator for the great blue state of California. Back in the 20s, when California had finally embraced the use of the legal trick known as civil forfeiture, the law had not yet been streamlined. It had still required some work, a little initiative. To take possession of a millionaire's mansion in those days, it had required that someone toss some poppy seeds over the fence into the mansion's lawn. Then you had to wait for the poppies to take root before you could break down the gate, pretend to be surprised when you found the poppies, assert that the mansion had been involved in heroin trafficking, and claim the house and its grounds on behalf of the people of California. In those days, Earl had been an entrepreneur, 
throwing or launching the seeds into the yard, then tipping off the police once the poppies were growing. He'd gotten a 10% finder's fee for his efforts. It had been very lucrative. But times had changed, and tipsters like him had gone out of business. Fortunately, Earl had leveraged his reliable reputation to get himself a job with the government investigating hacker attacks. He didn't need the money. His earlier venture had left him magnificently well healed. But half the fun was knocking down people who thought they were better than him. His new career taking down snotty genius hackers was almost as satisfying. His day started delightfully, with the ringing of his cell phone from the woman to whom he'd assigned the ringtone, why don't we do it in the road? Priscilla, so delightful to hear from you. Priscilla was the object of Earl's most earnest ongoing office infatuation. With a cute butt and flowing honey-gold hair, she was just what the doctor ordered for a love-starved fellow like himself. The voice on the phone was, alas, hard and unyielding. Priscilla still did not appreciate him. Earl, I have a job for you. Great. I'll come up to your office and we can discuss it. No need. I can get you started over the phone. She paused, then went into detail. One of the network tripwire systems detected unusual activity last night by a guy named Harry Ledbetter. Looks like he perused the Attorney General's private files while nominally recovering them into the AG's desktop. Accidentally deleted his files again, huh? Idiot. Earl knew Priscilla hated her boss's boss, and he took every opportunity to show his support for her opinion. Ledbetter, Earl. Concentrate. Sorry. Priscilla continued. Anyway, it appears as if Harry's been a naughty boy. He lingered over the golden folder. He might even have made a copy, though that's not clear. Earl's breath caught in his throat. The golden folder? Did even Priscilla know what that was? Earl only knew because of, well, a certain historical connection. His deep knowledge of this most secret of secrets was probably the reason he was getting this case. That's really serious, Priscilla. I better snatch this Harry guy and take him down to the interrogation center. Few people knew about the interrogation center beneath Capitol Park in Sacramento, but it was one of Earl's stomping grounds. Hold your horses, Earl. I've spent a little time studying this. The IP address Harry was using at the time isn't in Sacramento at all. So? He could have accessed the file from anywhere. Priscilla counted dryly. Not while showing up on the vid cams covering his office he couldn't. As if reading Earl's mind, she answered his next criticism. I also called his boss to make a quick physical check. The vid cams weren't tampered with. Harry really was in his office. Earl saw where this was going. Fished. Fished, Priscilla agreed. You'll have to hunt down the attacker. Make sure any and all copies of the data are destroyed. Earl sighed. So where's the attacker's IP address located anyway? For the first time ever, Priscilla sounded sympathetic. On the brain trust, Earl. I was able to narrow it down to a particular ship, the Gplex 2. You'll have to go out there to figure out who stole our files. Earl groaned. The brain trust was an archipelago of oversized cruise liners, first built when the Fed's deportation phase two went into Silicon Valley to expel all the foreign engineers. Gplex, FB, and all the other computer companies had simply moved their engineering teams onto cruise liners in international waters off the coast of San Francisco. The ships were stuffed to the gunwales with the smartest engineers and richest entrepreneurs in the world, snooty jerks to the last bastard, or the last bitch, as the case may be. This was so not going to be fun. At least getting to the brain trust was fast and easy. A plane to San Francisco, 
then a copter out to the archipelago. The copter was expensive, but that was fine. He'd put it on his expense account. The next step was hard. He had to get someone to take him seriously. There was a small peacekeeper station on the promenade deck of the Gplex too. He thought the local cops might be more enthusiastic about helping him than anybody else, so he wandered into their offices. Two people sat at adjacent desks and laughed together quietly. A dark fellow with some kind of Muslim turban and a big muscular blonde guy with a military haircut. Earl sat down by the white guy and looked at the nameplate on the desk. Whoa, who had a name like Wolf? Whatever. Mr. Uh, Wolf Griffin? My name is Earl Anderson. He pulled out his California State Lead Investigator badge. A serious crime has been committed in Sacramento, and we believe the perpetrator lives here on the Gplex too. Wolf Griffin raised an eyebrow. Was it a murder? A robbery? I'm surprised to hear any of our residents have been to Sacramento this past week. Surely you've heard the news. The governor is treating everyone from the Brain Trust like criminals at the moment. Earl swallowed hard. The relationship between the Brain Trust and California had nosedived since Space R had decided to move its launch facilities out of Vandenberg to the Brain Trust because of a new round of regulatory hurdles imposed by the state. No one was happy. Well, he still had a job to do, and these people were cops like him. It was a robbery, and they didn't go to Sacramento in person. They stole a very sensitive folder of data from the government. It was a phishing attack. Wolf sat back in his chair and rolled his eyes. Oh, Christ. He smiled grimly at Earl. What do you want from us? Earl pulled out a piece of paper. First, I'd like your help tracking down this IP address. We tracked the attack to it. Wolf peered at the paper, then shook his head. I can't help you with this without an order signed by either an officer of the Brain Trust Consortium or one of the shipboard mediators. Well, so much for professional courtesy. What kind of leverage did he have for these people? Ah, none. Throughout California, his powers were practically those of a god. But here? He sighed. So can you tell me about any hacker experts you have around here? People you've had trouble with in the past? Wolf's companion, R, according to the nameplate, laughed and surprised him by speaking with a crisp British accent. No troublemakers. No one wants to get tossed out and sent dirt side. As for hacker experts, just walk through the promenade and point a finger. Odds are, whoever you point at could run a good fishing attack. Wolf chuckled. They teach it in school. R added. And of the ones who are not in school, most of them are top flight software engineers who could easily hack anything they wanted. If you're looking for the holy trinity of crime, means, motive, and opportunity, you're in trouble. We have 10,000 people here, all of whom who have the means, all of whom had the opportunity. That leaves motive as the only discriminator, and at the moment, just about everyone is a bit ticked off at your government. Earl goggled at the men, still catching up with the conversation. They teach fishing in school? He considered further. So one of the motivations for fishing my government would be getting a good grade from a teacher? Both men laughed, a little sheepishly. Wolf acknowledged it. Yeah, a little over the top, I suppose. Earl looked at Wolf sharply. You guys must face thousands of fishing attacks here all the time, from the students. Wolf shook his head. The software systems on the Brain Trust use a different kind of security. They can't be fished, so I'm told. Ah chimed in. That's why all the kids have to do their fishing projects against dirt-side targets. Earl wondered if his head would explode. 
He calmed himself. So what grade are the kids in when they learn to fish? Wolf frowned. It's not that simple. Everyone uses an adaptive computer-based teaching system called the Excel that moves the kids through their coursework as fast as they can go. So a kid who has an instinctive grasp of computer software might move through the hacking modules in a heartbeat. There's probably a ten-year-old somewhere on the ship who's completed the fishing module. This just kept getting worse. In an attempt to help, R offered, You can look through the list of kids who've earned bonus merit reward tokens recently, if you think your culprit might be a student. I can show you the website announcing winners. Wolf chuckled. It's as good a place to start as any, unless you think you can get a mediator to sign off on your investigation. What classified data did they steal, anyway? You'll probably have to spill the beans to get a mediator to take you seriously. Earl shook his head. Please send me the link. I guess I'll have to figure this out on my own, and that seems as good a place to start as any. Earl settled into a cafe on the promenade, munched on a shrimp po'boy sandwich, and opened the browser on his tablet to the page of bonus token winners. It gave him something to do whilst trying to figure out a plan. But his luck had changed. The day after the break-in in Sacramento, a kid named Charlie Winston had received a large bonus for completing a module on fishing. Earl read the description of the module. Conduct a phishing attack against a site that uses two-factor authentication. Explain why it works. Attempt a comparable phishing attack against any site on the Brain Trust. Explain why phishing does not work against an object capability security infrastructure. Bonus merit reward tokens awarded for acquisition of documents labeled secret or higher. Revealing such documents to anyone except your teacher results in a loss of tokens. Topic. Computer security. Module. Attacks against the man-machine interface. Well. Earl was pretty sure he knew what the boy had gotten his bonus for. Thank you, Catherine McEwen, and of course to this week's co-host, Mark Stiegler. We've just finished with part one of Let the Bits Run Free. We'll be back next week with Catherine McEwen as the co-host for part two of the story. If you enjoyed this story, please check out The Brain Trust, A Harmony of Enemies from Mark Stiegler. That's book one in this series. It's available as an ebook. It's available in print and, of course, audio and narrated by Catherine McEwen. We've had one new audiobook released this week Bright is Her Sight, which is book two in the School of Necessary Magic series by Judith Behrens and narrated by Kate Rudd. If you're a fan of that series, please check out the audiobook. Next week at LMBPN brings Volume 3 of Tales of the Cartharian Universe, where fans of the universe take their shot at writing for other fans of the universe. It's a fantastic project that is fun for the authors, the fans, and for us at LMBPN. Please look for that early next week. We've got a great group of volunteers that help to put all that together, and it really is a collaborative project within LMBPN where everyone gets involved, and it's so exciting on release day to find a new group of published authors who just happen to be fans of the Cartharian Gambit universe. So please check that out. As always, thanks so much for listening. We will be back in your ear next Friday. Mm -hmm.